Good morning. Welcome. We're glad to have you with us for this wonderful event. My name is Janet Milkovich, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. The League is proud to be an organization that is nonpartisan, <clears throat> neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any government level. We are also fully committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in both practice and principle, engaging all individuals, households, communities, and policymakers in creating a more perfect democracy. <clears throat> Our program this morning, Kansas legislation, Legislative Session, The Highs and Lows, What Do We Know?, is being moderated by the famous Clay Wirestone, the opinion editor of the Kansas City Reflector. He will introduce our Johnson County legislators, then start our conversation on redistricting, public education, voter rights, and LGBTQ. If you subscribe to the Kansas City Reflector, our moderator, Clay Wirestone, is already known to you. Sometimes I find myself cheering at my computer screen as I read his opinion piece. Sometimes I shed a tear or two as well. But on June 9th, Clay summarized what editors and reporters are responsible for, uncovering facts, assembling them into a coherent whole, and then sharing them with the reader. At that point, Clay reminds us, journalists have done their job and then it becomes the job of the community to assemble diverse coalitions and raise our voices to make change. That's exactly what the League of Women Voters, Mainstream Coalition and Voter Right Network of Wyandotte County is all about, right? Clay recently won first place in the Division 7 editorial page category. Congrats, congratulations to you for that honor. He's written Thank columns you. and edited reporting in four states. And this is the fun part. He has fact-checked politicians and research for Larry the Cable Guy. That's a story for another time, Clay. Clay lives in Lawrence with his husband and son. Clay, welcome. And thank you so much for moderating this program and our remarkable panelists. I turn this over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Janet. I really appreciate the invitation to be here and uh, the chance to, to talk with everyone today. Um, so, yeah, so yes, Larry, Larry the Cable Guy, another time, but it is true. So let's just start uh, by introducing uh, our panelists really quickly here. We have at least online right now, we have Representative Stephanie Clayton, uh, Senator Diana Sykes, who is also the Senate Minority Leader, um, and Senator Cindy Holscher. Um, we've been uh, scheduled to have um, Representative Brandon Woodard and Representative Joella Hoy. I believe they were both planning to be here. Um, if they do uh, log in, I, I think they'll be uh, added to the added to the speaker list here at the top. Um, so state, oh, oh, there it is. There's, there's Representative Hoy. So Representative Joella Hoy is also here. So fantastic. Um, and just double, okay. So, so we're just down uh, Representative Woodard right now. So, and I know he was having some challenges with his internet connections. So I think the first thing I would I would just say in talking about this last legislative session was in talking to my coworkers at the Reflector. Um, our general feeling at the end of the session was one of exhaustion. Uh, there was a lot, and it was full tilt until the very last day, uh, and it was not entirely sure what would happen in many many high profile races until um, high profile bills and policy uh, questions until that very last day. Um, however, you didn't have a central, you know, I'm a journalist, so I look at narrative, I look at stories, you didn't have something along the lines of the Brownback tax experiment or some other giant story that everyone was following. You had a lot of stories, a lot of things happening at high volume all the time. So we're tracing several different issues today, and we 
thankfully have legislators who played central roles in addressing them here with us right now. So let's just jump right into it uh, with Minority Leader Sykes and talk about um, the most <laughs> talk about redistricting because that was definitely a thread throughout the session. So, um, Senator Sykes, how do you think the redistricting process uh, this year went uh, for both the congressional and the state legislative maps? And, and more specifically, how do you see that uh, affecting Johnson County? Yeah, so talking about highs and lows, redistricting was definitely one of those. Uh, you know, as we look the maps didn't necessarily break the letter of the law, but I don't think that means that they were right. And there are consequences. One of those is elections. And, you know, when you go in with a super minority, it's hard to um, make a win there. So, you know, I think we're going to have to do our work and um, from the local level all the way up to the congressional level so that 10 years from now we can have better maps. Um, you know, definitely trying to disenfranchise voters, um, Wyandotte County specifically, and Lawrence, your hometown, I mean, you're in the big first. Um, so they put a lot of things, um, I think, trying to make it harder for Democrats and um, limiting our voice. But I hope that people will be more engaged because of that. Um, you know, even our Senate maps, um, they made our districts for most of the Democratic senators better for us when it comes to re-election, but making some of those that are close, um, that were really our seats that we thought we could um, flip easily, a little bit more challenging. But, um, you know, I ran to fight for Kansas and good policy, and that's what I'll do. And so, you know, it's even now starting, making sure that we're out there talking to voters, making sure that they know what's happening in their districts and are they really represented. So um, it is more challenging, but um, I hope Kansas are aware. And, you know, honestly, I mean, Connie's on here. Connie was fighting the good fight for Wyandotte County. And, you know, time and time again, we saw where the majority party was not listening to the will of Kansans. And um, really, it's sad, but because it did not break the letter of the law, um, we are dealt the hand we're dealt and um, we will just continue to fight. And so for the, the uh, rest of you all on here, uh, Reps uh, Clayton and Hoy and Senator uh, Holscher, um, what changes would you all like to see in the redistricting process? And how do you think Kansans could be part of making those uh, changes? Well, as a member of the House Redistricting Committee, one of the things that I found very upsetting about the process, and I'm sure that many of you all uh, watching and Senator Sykes as well feel this, is that um, we had a real issue with what I would call fake transparency. It's sort of like, you know, we had these very minimal meetings. The one that was in Johnson County was held in the middle of the day on the first day of school in the middle of a pandemic in a room that could not accommodate a lot of people. Time was limited. It seemed to have a very uh, rural bent as far as that was concerned. I felt like rural Kansas had a voice. And if you're in the population centers, which do tend to trend more moderate Republican, more unaffiliated and more democratic, those more urban centers, those more popular areas did not get an equal voice. So I would like to see more equal representation. But above all, I think that it is time that we change our constitution to remove this process from the hands of the legislators and put it into the hands of the people. There are a number of different ways that we could do this. You see lots of different states have different processes. But I think a nonpartisan layperson redistricting commission is going to be our ideal. Because as you saw from these maps, Maps, you know, not only are they wrong, but I'm embarrassed for the people that drew these because what you can only win if you tie your opponents one arm behind their back, you know, have some self-respect. I'm embarrassed for them uh, that this is what they had to do. But as Senator Sykes said, we need to continue to fight. And that's why uh, if reelected on day one, I introduce a bill, hopefully bipartisan co-sponsored, that will move it 
redistricting from this process to a nonpartisan redistricting commission. Even Derek Schmidt supported that when he was a senator. So I'm sure we can all agree that it's past time. Representative Hoy or Senator Holscher? I would echo those comments. I think, I think when when you're in the midst of it and it's coming up, like it just people think, oh, this is a risk because a, another process that uh, is is nonpartisan with people who actually know the data, know how to draw maps, uh, you do risk drawing incumbents in together, and we just need to be willing to put. Uh, the state of Kansas and fair maps ahead of our own uh, representation, potential representation. And I fully support what Representative Clayton said. The voters should choose who represents them, not the other way around. And it, I don't know, I, I do appreciate that they went on the road, but we really need to have a nonpartisan process because look what we got. It, it's not uh, it's not ideal and it's, just, and it's not fair. I want to comment on something that um, Representative Clayton said. You know, I think it's very telling, which when we have a supermajority party that is drawing the maps and they're so afraid of the super minority um, that they're drawing these in ways that it makes it just harder. I'm like, they have the votes for everything that they want. And um, but they're so afraid of really the will of the people that they're trying to do everything that they can to um, keep that power. Yeah, and I will just echo that, um, you know, I, I guess we're a scary bunch in the super minority um, that uh, but this is what was needed to redraw these maps in such a way to make it very, very difficult uh, for us to become more than a super minority. But yeah, the best way to fix this is to move it to a nonpartisan process as Representative Clayton um, and others indicated earlier. Um, and I would, I would also point out at least from what I recall is we still don't actually know for sure. There are rumors. Um, who drew the maps that were passed, where exactly they came from, who precisely made those, no, those decisions. Um, so, you know, to, to say it's a, you know, there was some effort made at gaining public feedback, but in terms of actual transparency of how some of those things actually happened, um, it, it's not publicly known, um, as far as I, as far as I understand. Um, so, so moving on, uh, Representative uh, Clayton. Um, so we know the Kansas elections are safe and secure. Uh, our Republican Secretary of State, Scott Schwab, has said so repeatedly, probably at some cost to himself. Uh, but we've seen legislators uh, spread information throughout the session. I know I wrote about it. I know our Editor-in-Chief, Sherman Smith, wrote about it. Um, and they did continue to try to pass bills making it harder to vote. So uh, how do you think um, the public can hold elected officials accountable when they put out incorrect information? What's, what's your take kind of on this whole, this whole mess? Okay, well, thank you, Clayton. Sorry about that. My dog had gotten a hold of a pair of shoes and I had to confiscate them. So it's an <laughs> interesting morning here at my house. But in any case, so first things first, we do have secure elections. Uh, I think some of you might have noticed, those of you who are Republicans will see that there are two. there is a challenger to our incumbent Secretary of the State. And um, that person is a far right individual who says that the election was stolen. And, you know, look, I don't like it when I lose elections or when people that I support lose their elections. But when we start calling into question the integrity of our elections, we are calling into question the very legitimacy of democracy. Now, um, our Secretary of State and I, uh, when we served together in the legislature, we definitely disagreed on a number of issues. But I've known him for years. I do find him to be a professional. And I think that he is doing a good job. It's very reflective, too. We've seen Secretary of state get attacked nationally, some of them uh, with death threats and some, you know, worse than that. So I am unsure if our secretary of state has received those things, but I would not be surprised knowing how hot the political climate is. 
And, um, you know, not to sound like too much of a conspiracy theorist here, but oftentimes we look at cyber attacks from other countries. And I'm not just saying that because my Twitter was hacked by uh, NFT bros this week. Boy, that was the worst. But, um, but what I'm saying is that you will see other countries finding ways to undermine Americans' faith in various things, just sort of through uh, posting bots uh, online, you know, or bots posting comments, pardon me, to sort of, sort of sow the seeds of discord. We've seen that with the anti-vaxxer movement even prior to COVID, and we've seen it with our election integrity. So I think one of the most important things that we can do is to stand together in our trust of a very secure system, and we know that this is secure. In my years in the legislature, I've seen sort of, you know, with um, Chris Kobach, who our former Secretary of State, in a lot of his presentations for years, uh, even back in my young Republican days, seeing the way that he would just sort of chip away at things and talk about voter fraud in an academic way, for instance, talking about some of the voter fraud legitimate voter fraud that occurred in the bleeding Kansas days when Missourians would come over and vote here. But you start off talking, oh gosh, look at this history, and then trying to say that it's happening now. Uh, the movie Mean Girls has a line saying, stop trying to make fetch happen. And in many ways, they're trying to make an untruth true. So I think that one of the ways that we as citizens can hold our elected officials accountable is by calling into question asking for proof. And if you notice someone is lying, and trust me, I've gone door to door for years, people are smart. They can tell when you're full of it. They can tell when you're not being truthful. And what is incumbent upon all of you that are watching today is to call out politicians when you notice that they're full of it. Ask them to cite their sources and tell your friends. Because I think the voter to voter program that mainstream has is very important. I think it's a lot more valuable. I'm more likely to vote for someone or to go to a restaurant or to buy a product that is recommended by someone that I know and trust as opposed to something that I hear just in the ether. So I think, again, just the old chatting over the back fence, that sort of thing does have a tremendous amount of value. And that's how we spread truth and sort of out a lot of these people that are trying to make you afraid. Just remember, note to self, if a politician is needling you and trying to make you feel bad or ugly or upset, they're probably not the good guy. That's a gross tactic. And so just bear that in mind as you sort of move forward in this next election cycle. You know, Representative Clayton, there is there is so much so so much to unpack there and so much that we've we've written about and tried to to spread the word about. And I think it is, at least from my perspective as as an opinion columnist, something that I feel like I really come to understand. I knew it before, but I've seen it even more glaringly at the reflector. There are a lot of people in the legislature who know the truth in both parties. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times, a handful of people who are very obsessed with conspiracy theories or with fear mongering, they become the loudest voices in the room. They get a little bit of a following and other people are uncomfortable. Other elected legislators are uncomfortable at challenging them because who wants to who wants the the aggravation really to 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 call out someone who's just saying something nutty. And I really feel like this is a situation where the public has a has a real role to play in giving space for people who know the truth and who understand the truth to be willing to to say it. May I follow up, please? Of course. All right. So I will say I'm not uncomfortable calling people out. That's why I always seem to get into trouble when I'm up there. Um, but I think that, you know, again, as, as it's been stated before, good trouble is a good thing. And also, one thing I would urge all of you to do, and, you know, now the term gaslighting is very much in vogue, right? But I started using that way back in the brownback days when they were trying to say, oh no, the budget's doing great, our economy's growing, as things were literally on fire uh, surrounding us. And so 
one of those things that I would urge you all to do is just simply Google simple ways to deal with a gaslighter. So a lot of times you, you know, the thing is, is that they'll say crazy things, right? Like the election was stolen and our instinct sometimes is to say, no, it's not. And then to add several curse words onto the end of that sentence, right? And insults as well. But the best thing to do is to just calmly say, no, it isn't. This, these are the sources and continue to repeat and calmly deal. And so it's, it is frustrating, but you know, they love it when we freak out, they love it when we get mad. And, um, you know, I have found that honestly, those folks in the middle, what, um, you know, I know Nixon coined this term silent majority, obviously I'm not being Nixonian here, but it is a good phrase because we have a lot of people that are sitting here quietly thinking to themselves, man, I don't know about this. And those are the people, I think that all that we want as Americans, as Kansans, is to have things be normal, calm, and reasonable so that we can have a solid baseline, a touchstone, so that government is basically functioning like air conditioning, right? Because when it's working, you don't really notice, but when it breaks, you definitely notice. And so we want our government to hum along quietly, keeping us comfortable so we can go live our lives. And so as legislators, it's our job to do that. As voters, it's your job to calmly question and calmly address when you know, when the air conditioning is definitely breaking, you know, we got to throw out those broken pieces and make sure it's running fine. And the way that you do it is through calm, reasoned, and firm interaction. I want to also add, if I may, Clay, um, I mean, the house, all of the house is up for re-election. You can look and see who filed, but reach out. I mean, if those people right now, if they won't sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and talk about things, they're not going to call you or they're not going to um, have a relationship with you when you need them. So this is the prime time to see, okay, is this person going to speak out to the truth because they're going to first, they're going to meet with me, or are they just going to, you know, do what their leadership tells them? So uh, now is a great opportunity. Um, and we have a lot of contested elections in Johnson County. Okay. So we've, we've started off with a blast of politics. We had redistricting, we have, uh, we've had elections. So Senator Holster, let's change lanes just a little bit. Uh, talking about public education, one of the biggest things that the legislature deals with every session. Um, and frankly, a really kind of a hot button topic uh, this year in a lot of different ways. Uh, from critical race theory to God only knows what else. Um, but so what uh, public education bills this session, um, either passed or not passed or very close to being passed, uh, what, did, what did you see that would have been the most detrimental, the most harmful to public education and, and why? Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you know, it was very interesting after um, two years of dealing with the pandemic where our public schools and our teachers really bore the brunt of kind of helping get us through uh, that time frame. You would have hoped that the legislature would have responded with bills that were supportive of our teachers and our schools, but that definitely was not the case. Instead, um, you know, we have this faction that's been pushing to privatize and been pushing for the collapse of our public schools. And they saw this as an opportunity uh, to, to strike when, you know, when things are in a, a concerning situation. So instead of supportive bills to help our teachers in our schools, we saw close to 20 uh, very detrimental bills brought forward. And uh, a few of them passed. Uh, a few of them got vetoed and then uh, you know, the legislature was not able to override those vetoes. But what you need to know is that uh, some of the most concerning provisions, um, and, and this was made clear or, you know, before before this happened, probably a month and a half prior, uh, Christy Williams, the chair of the Education Committee, said that she was going to put these provisions in the funding bill. And you know, here's the situation: the funding bill didn't get passed until the end of this, uh, the end of the session, which obviously put us in a very bad position because um, contract negotiations start. You know, we were coming up against these timeframes that are very, very concerning. So we have to have the funding bill. Um, 
And so she did exactly what she said she was going to do. She stuck these provisions into the funding bill. And, and of them, there's a few that are very concerning. Um, one of them sets up some standards as far as um, different areas that are to be measured in our public schools. You know, standards are great, but here's the deal. These standards are set higher than I believe any other state in the country. So it's a setup for failure because what, what this faction wants to do is they want to be able to say, oh, well, you know, here's what we wanted and our public schools couldn't accomplish this. Never mind the fact that we have award-winning public schools who do sensational, phenomenal things every single day. Um, and that's across the state. So we have that issue. But probably one of the areas that is um, even more concerning is what's called the open borders provision. And, you know, that one sounds good to a lot of people initially. Uh, sometimes parents start to think, oh, well, I've got a kiddo who maybe hasn't been receiving uh, certain services that they need at their local school. Now I can send them to another district. Well, one, you can already petition to do that. You can petition to do um, inter-district moves. You can petition to move outside district moves. Uh, but this makes it so that, like I said, that it's any district in the state. This is a bill designed to undermine our schools and to create chaos, because here's the fact of the matter. Uh, if you have a child that needs special ed services and they're not getting it at their local school, guess what? We're having those struggles all over the state. <laughs> and it goes back to the fact that we have about 300 vacancies for special ed teachers across the state. That's a big issue. Um, additionally, we tried to get special ed funding increased this year. We had the revenue to do it, but that faction again said no, and they have a super majority. So we couldn't get that to happen. So, you know, the, the best thing to do here is to fund all of our schools fully fund special ed, do it adequately, and do it equitably. And, you know, there's a couple other things that need to be mentioned about that open borders issue. Um, you know, here's one thing that's interesting. If a child goes from their home district to a different district, that receiving district um, will likely have to pick up the tab in respect to that 30% that comes from local funding. That's a property tax shift. And I don't think a lot of people are thinking about that. But here's something else. So once a kid is accepted into another district, they are there for as long as they want. So you can have a new family move into that district, live a block from the school, not get admitted because it's quote full. Um, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. At the heart of it though, the part of this provision that really um, is upsetting to me is the fact that um, it's white flight. It creates two tiers. The haves can go ahead and get the transportation and have the means to go to another district if they want to. That leaves behind the have nots. Um, something similar to this was done in Minnesota. And I believe we saw in less than a seven year period, an 18% change as far as racial moves. So again, um, it's white flight. Um, somebody also mentioned the sports aspect of this bill. You can anticipate that people will try to recruit students to go to different schools. Um, and that's another issue as far as uh, opening those borders. Additionally, you know, another question was asked on this topic. <clears throat> um, we don't know if it necessarily says that it would prohibit students from Missouri from crossing the line. So, that could be another issue and potentially um, cause Kansas to be in more litigation moving forward, which is something that uh, this legislature has really struggled to fund our schools adequately and tends to get us in a lot of litigious trouble. So like I said, there's there's another possibility on the horizon in that respect. Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Senator Holscher. I know that something I have, have written about and I think is is clear to folks who track the legislature is as important as public schools are to voters in Kansas and residents of Kansas, there is a concerted, continuing, well-funded effort to undermine public education in Kansas. And it, it operates on multiple tiers. It, it's there every year no matter kind of, and it, it comes in a lot of different forms, a lot of different disguises. Um, and, you know, just as, as you saw this year, you know, there was a, a lot of concern 
about the uh, the parents' bill of rights, quote unquote, legislation. I, I believe that was vetoed and did not become law um, because, of course, that was a giant package that put a lot of suspicion on teachers. Mm -hmm. Yet you still had these other policy proposals in the education funding bill that did become law. So it's like if you don't get it in one area, it's it's in another. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, here's the thing. I mean, like I said, this, this, you know, these provisions that were stuck in there are totally to create chaos and undermine our public schools. And just to that point, I mean, there is a very concerted effort to collapse our public schools. And think about what that will do to the economy, not just here in Johnson County, but beyond. But also this, I mean, you know, the people pushing this, um, I don't know if you know, they think it's as easy as flipping a switch and go, okay, your schools are now all privatized. I mean, think of, you know, we just got done with the pan. Well, we're not even done with the pandemic. We had two years of a pandemic that has been, you know, traumatic to kids. You know, now we're going to do this and create all of the uncertainty of completely changing a system. So yeah, it, you know, like I said, that's, that is what's there. Um, and here's the concerning thing. So a number of these provisions, including open borders is slated to start in 2024. What that means to you all out there is that essentially we've got two election cycles to change the trajectory or it is full speed ahead on collapsing the schools. And I know that's scary, but that's what you got to know, because they have chipped away and chipped away and chipped away for so many years. And now, like I said, this is where we are. We are on the cliff. Now, here's the other important thing. We've had Governor Kelly to veto some of these bills. If we don't have her, guess what? This probably all gets fast tracked. So 2024, like I said, you know, is when some of these provisions start. But it is critical that... Uh, not just that everybody on this call get out there and vote, but you got to talk to 10 friends, get them involved with voter to voter. Um, you know, we have that group of 18 to 34 in age range that are the least likely to vote. They have the most at stake. Again, you know, I think we've probably taken for granted the fact that we've had great schools here. It is all up in the air. And like I said, we are on the cliff. So uh, it is imperative like I said, that that people show up, that you get a few friends involved um, and that we elect some candidates and that we reelect Governor Kelly or again, this gets fast tracked. I hop in just want to add to all of that because and just say, yes, there is a very concerted real effort to dismantle public education in Kansas. And if anyone running for office tries to tell you that education is just really not going to be that big of a campaign issue, push back because it's definitely what I heard. I got most of my emails this last session about the parents' bill of rights that could have banned library books about education savings accounts. And though, though those major efforts failed this time around, they're gradually chipping away at the notion that public dollars should fund public schools. They, the last two years, we've expanded eligibility for the child or for the, um, the tax credit for, uh, scholarship program. And that program has no oversight. It's, it's, uh, next year, I assume they're going to be back. There's a $10 million max. Now they're going to want to expand it. We have to watch out for these things and push back. And frankly, they're going to say, try to avoid this issue because there is this effort and they know it's not popular, but a lot of, uh, there is a lot of bipartisan support statewide for public schools, but we just don't see a lot of pushback, uh, and, throughout the, the whole entire session and people saying that out loud and communicating it. Uh, it's really, it is really frankly one-sided and Democrats who are mostly doing the heavy lifting on vocalizing support for our public schools. And it is a huge, huge election issue. Absolutely. We have to be talking about our public schools and defending our teachers, our administrators, and everyone who worked their tails off 
through a very hard time during the pandemic. And we need to make sure that we stick up for funding to go that goes to achievement, that goes to learning, because we're going to be seeing more and more informational hearings that are end up as budget provisos for private vendors and things that actually take money away uh, from, from what our school districts want us to use it on. So please push back, please make this a priority issue because it, it is in jeopardy. And Governor Kelly is the education governor and we've got to keep her there. So, um, so to, to move from one uh, cheery subject to another, that's a sarcastic remark, but uh, so, uh, so, you know, we're looking at, at we're talking, we were talking about schools, Representative Foy, and, and now to talk about schools in another um, much sadder sense, you know, we've had the unthinkable uh, school shooting in Texas. Um, we also had a shooting uh, at Olathe East High School. Uh, what kind of measures would you like to see the legislature take up next session to make our schools safer uh, or to reduce um, reduce gun related violence? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you talked about reducing gun violence because gun violence uh, has has many different impacts on our communities. People die of preventable gun violence every day in this country. And in Kansas, uh, we are seeing an increase as well. So. Absolutely, we want to have um, safety measures in place so that kids are safe at school, so we're safe in our parks, in our homes, uh, walking down the street. This is a uh, it's a it's a crisis, and it's not unique to just a school environment. And it is a direct relation because we have weakened our gun laws over the past just over a decade uh, uh, to the point where it's just very easy for people to have access to guns. We do not require background checks on all gun sales federally or at the state level. And what this means is that, let's say, for instance, last year, we in the in the legislature lowered the age to conceal carry from 21 down to 18. So we've expanded access to guns for uh, high school students and students on college campuses. But you have to be 21 years old to buy a handgun. So this just shows you background checks aren't required on all gun sales because 18, 19, and 20 year olds can still uh, purchase handguns through uh, a gun show. They can go on arms lists, arrange private sales, and those sales are technically legal sales. So as we chip away at those common sense measures, it just gives easier and easier access to people who really shouldn't have their hands on guns. And we have open carry in Kansas. So 18, 19, 20 year olds, they can purchase long guns, open carry those around. But when you gave them access to a concealed carry permit, that means they can actually carry them more places too, because the state also forces local governments, municipalities to have to allow guns on their premises, including while they're on the job and on or off their premises into your home. So what does that mean? If you're having a, someone come out to give you a permit, the city government can have no requirements for, for them. They can just carry a gun on them while they're on the job, lifeguards, uh, firefighters. So I don't think people have the full extent of how much we chipped away at these laws because it happened over the course of a, a number of different years. And uh, of course we don't require permits and training to carry a hidden loaded gun in Kansas and expanding access to untrained and potentially dangerous people has not made us safer. And I've gone back, looked at the testimony. Those who were there um, in the legislature know that they were sold, the, the, the people testifying as proponents of uh, permitless carry said, this is going to make our state safer. This is going to make crime go down. It didn't do that. Crime has gone up and we have seen nationwide that states with the weakest gun laws have the highest rates of, of violent crime. So a lot of this is going to be, we need to be on the defense and try to stop any further rollbacks of our gun laws. But we also need common sense legislation that we know will help um, keep guns out of the hands of people with dangerous histories. Senator Sykes and I both um, introduced the uh, companion bills in the Senate and the House 
that would require uh, those convicted of domestic violence misdemeanors, stalking and restraining orders to relinquish firearms upon those convictions. And that is just creating a process so that they can safely have this relinquishment order, order issued by a judge when they become prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms. It takes into account guns they may already have, and then they have a streamlined process in place to be able to turn those guns over to law enforcement or a federally licensed gun dealer for the period of the time that they're prohibited from purchasing and possessing. So it's kind of another one of those where you need to push back and say, all right, you want to enforce laws already on the books. Well, let's do that. We have bills ready to go that actually do that. They they don't interfere with law abiding gun owners. These are people who aren't supposed to have a gun anyway. And it it does it does take a little bit of getting into the weeds to um, push back because most people, when you talk to them, agree that domestic abusers should not have guns. So it's a lot of um, public, a lot of educating people and really pushing back on, on that message that uh, somehow just because you want common sense gun laws, that you're, you're a gun grabber and you want to take away everyone's guns. That's just not true. And we have a really big need to get stakeholders, law enforcement, the district attorneys and survivors of gun violence before these committees and have um, people testify and share their stories about the impact that our weak gun laws have had on public safety and the lives of Kansans. So uh, I know there's a lot, a lot um, that I've mentioned there, but it is far past time to take action and to stop uh, passing bills that are written by the gun industry because they want to sell more guns to, to teenagers and people who aren't supposed to have them. Uh, and it's time to take a good hard look and be brave enough to pass uh, like uh, Senator Clayton's background checks bill and these domestic violence bills. Uh, and I hope that we can get more uh, hearings in place and really study the issue next year. And to, oh. um, add on to that, like, I mean, it really is going to take people getting into the weeds. You know, we have law enforcement officers who say we don't want to um, abide by the law because it's putting us in danger. But then you have legislators who are saying we want to arm our teachers. Um, and then police officers are afraid to relinquish those guns that we know these are people who are not allowed to have them because um, federally the law, the state law is saying they're not, but there's concern about that relinquishment. Um, and I think, you know, right now I'm getting more and more emails from constituents and some of these are very conservative people and they're like, we need to do something. Um, but again, the majority party is afraid of having these conversations. The only reason we got a hearing in the Senate this year is because they didn't want to take a vote on the Senate floor as an amendment. So they agreed to have a hearing. And I chose to push a hearing trying to educate more and more people on this but it's something that we really need to talk about because when you're having more and more legislators saying we want teachers armed and we already have, I think this year we're projected to have 2000 um, un, or vacancies in our teachers and they're requiring this, but some of our police officers, not all are opposed to these common sense laws. I mean, we have to, make our neighbors aware of this. Yeah, and I want to jump in there too. Um, I'm on the Fed and State Committee, which typically hears the bills that deal with things like firearms. Um, I had two common sense bills. One was in regard to safely storing firearms. Um, and then the other one was to prohibit ghost guns. My son attends Olathe East, which is where, which was the site um, of a shooting this year. And after that event, um, the local DA came out and said, you know, we should prohibit ghost guns. And just to give a quick background, um, those are guns that can be essentially put together by ordering a kit online or ordering different pieces um, or even uh, using a 3D printer to assemble a gun. So uh, I put the bill together in that regard. Again, neither one of those got a hearing. Again, very common sense measures that are supported by the general public. But 
What we did get a hearing on in Fed and State was the Eddie the Eagle bill. And this is an NRA sponsored bill. It's an NRA program that is portrayed to be um, a safety program. Um, when in effect, one of the other uh, one of the other groups that came to testify in support of the bill said they supported it because they needed to find a new market. That's what this is. Eddie the Eagle um, is another marketing strategy uh, as far as helping develop another another market. Um, it is not proven as far as being helpful in safety issues. Uh, there are other programs out there that are. But again, here's the interesting thing. Um, that bill was granted a hearing. Um, was there was a surprise vote done on it in committee. Usually we as committee members are told which bills are going to be worked. We weren't told, uh, but that was how that committee was run pretty much the entire session. And uh, Johnson County and Senator Rob Olson is the chair of that committee. And not only was that the case on this particular bill, but several bills in regard to elections. Uh, people who were there People who were in support of bad election bills seem to have advanced notice of those bills coming up, whereas people who opposed those did not. And then again, surprise votes and things all got rolled in together in different bills. Um, lots of bundling was done. Um, I will mention to you, too, interesting thing on Eddie the Eagle. I did ask this question in committee. You know, it's another bill that is, quote, great for our schools. Yet, it's only for public schools. So I asked, I said, you know, if this is such a great program, why is it limited to our public schools? You know, why aren't you taking it to these private schools, which incidentally, same people who were pushing the Eddie the Eagle are also happy to push the collapsing of our schools. And I said, you know, why aren't you taking this program to the private schools? It was crickets. No answer on that. But again, so many of these bills that come forward by a lot of these different groups um, are there to undermine education. They kind of are all woven together as far as their efforts uh, to create chaos and undermine our public schools. Okay, so can I, can I real quick just yes. add on to that because that bill did make it to the governor's desk last year and they tried to run just basically the same thing again this year and Governor Kelly vetoed it and that was successfully sustained. So if we want to stop these, you know, bad guns bills, we need to have a gun sense governor. And the, the most dangerous aspect of the, the NRA's any eagle, eagle Bill is that it doesn't prohibit the use of guns and live ammunition as part of the education programs. And there are loopholes uh, intentionally created in federal and state law that would allow instructors of these of these uh, courses to have guns in the classroom. And they may say like, oh, no, they would never do that. But if we don't put that language in there, which I offered amendment to do that on the House floor and it failed, and they know they know these facts. They know that uh, it wouldn't be against the law to have guns in there as part of these programs. Um, that just goes to show you that they do want more guns in our K through 12 classrooms. So, I mean, that program starts in kindergarten. So it is extreme what we're talking about here. OK, so I just want to pop into chat here. That is a Kansas Reflector podcast that uh, Representative Hoy did back in March <clears throat> talking about some talking about some of these proposals, if anyone wants to copy that and follow up later. So uh, Representative uh, Clayton, uh, moving on to, to, uh, to you, this, um, so we saw, um, you know, the LGBTQ community has been targeted by the legislature for a bunch of sessions. We saw another attempt this year, uh, a failed attempt uh, to ban transgender athletes from playing for public schools on girls teams. Um, how has the legislature, um, you know, you and whomever um, managed to hold off uh, off these bills? Because it was stopped last year, it was stopped this year. Well, I think, again, there's been a long history of these types of attacks. Uh, my first term, so second year of my first term, there was a bill, um, House Bill 2453. Don't ask me why I still remember the numbers. Sometimes we remember the numbers of the really nasty ones. And that one was so egregious that it allowed EMTs to not care for individuals and, and to, you know, just based on their religious exemption, you know, not to care for individuals in the LGBTQ community. 
Uh, and that bill actually did end up passing the House and got stopped in the Senate. Part of the reason why, sorry, my dog's trying to destroy something. That's the noise in the background. Um, she wants attention. Um, but part of the reason why we were able to stop that on the Senate side, even uh, back in 2014, was because we had the business communities coming out so strongly against it. In particular, AT&T came out, the Kansas Chamber came out. And I think that... One of the ways, because we, you know, until um, you have a majority of people who support individuals in this community, you're not going to see the strong um, blocking of legislation without bipartisanship, right? And so one way to get more conservative people to support, uh, we found that two ways really do that. Um, Unfortunately, folks who tend to track a little bit more conservative are not so much on empathy until they know someone. So maybe their daughter or maybe their uncle or maybe their next door neighbor, a good friend. So if they know someone in the LGBTQ community, they're able to develop empathy and to vote accordingly. Uh, I also think that the business community is a strong ally in this regard because we have seen from some of our chambers of commerce strong support of members of this community. And so, you know, I've talked to uh, talked to the mainstream group about this before and to this audience about this before, is that a lot of times as a legislator, we support things with our head and we support things with our heart. And so a lot of times when I talk about supporting things with my head, it sounds heartless because it is. But bottom line, it does not make money to discriminate against groups of people. Businesses want to do business with everyone. They want to be able to hire everyone. They want to be able to recruit nationally and bring people into Kansas. And you cannot do that if you've got a hostile and hateful legislature. And so from my heart, I know that it's right to be decent. But when you look at these companies that want to make money, they know that discrimination does not pay. Now, I think it's also helpful. Uh, when I first started, we did not have any uh, any out open members of the legislature who were members of the LGBTQ community. And then history was made in the 2018 election when we elected Representative Brandon Woodard, who due to technical issues couldn't be here today, but he is a strong force. And we also have Representative Susan Ruiz. And so we got those two in. And then in 2020, we elected Representative Stephanie Byer and we uh, appointed in 2021 Representative Heather Meyer. And so having those four members of the LGBTQ caucus is very important because now legislators, even the most conservative, are forced to empathize because now they are looking. These are their colleagues. These are people they are sitting next to on the floor. And so I think that the more that we humanize everyone. I think that's helpful. And I also think that we have strong national backing. So um, we were able to sustain the veto of the anti-trans bill, largely because it's not just an issue of supporting trans people. It's also an issue of potential child abuse. I don't want someone saying under the guise of, oh gosh, well, your child, we're not sure what their gender is, let's subject the, them to an exam. I think that we can all agree that we don't want perverts looking at our little kids naked. And that's what that bill would have allowed. And that's wrong. That opens the door to sexual abuse. Trans children are much more likely to be subject to sexual abuse because everyone seems to find that their business. And so I think that stopping sexual abuse of children is important. And I think that's also part Part of the reason why we were able to sustain the veto on this terrible piece of legislation. I'm sorry, I talked a lot, but there's a lot. Oh, that's say. that's fine. This is a forum. Although um, I will say at this point, uh, since it's 1027, um, I'm going to uh, pull an audible as is that a thing they say? I think it is like a sports thing. Anyway, moving on to some of the call and audible. Yeah. Uh, some of the questions submitted uh, by our audience uh, today, we have a bunch of questions, so I just want to make sure that we have some time to get to some of those. Um, and the first one uh, is a juicy one. Uh, do we know who is a, a fight funding the attack on public education and why are they ta targeting public schools and how can we fight back? So have it that one. 
You know, I'll start with that. Um, there are some organizations who really uh, are full force on defunding our schools. That's KPI, AFP. Uh, Dave Trayward is one of their lobbyists. He is at the Capitol as well as other lobbyists that work for those organizations daily. Um, and they are in the offices of our legislators telling them things like, our schools are failing, um, telling them things that just aren't accurate, you know, and then to counter that, you know, sadly, you know, our teachers and staff people, they're working during the day. They can't go to Topeka and be there consistently um, like these lobbyists can, um, and, you know, and then the other thing that's that's a real struggle here is the fact that in the Senate, out of 40 senators, I think there's only four of us who have kids in public schools. I mean, there is a huge disconnect between um, what's actually happening in our schools and what some of these legislators believe. And then that's exacerbated by people like Dave Trabert telling them falsehoods. Um, and I think in the House, it's pretty similar. You know, 125 um, House positions, I think under 20 have kids in public schools. And, you know, you, you see bills coming forward that honestly make no sense. Um, you know, sometimes you've got people who are bringing forward bills that are more reflective of when they went to school 30 and 40 years ago. Um, I did bring forward an amendment this year that basically said that anytime a, uh, a legislator <clears throat> has a bill that affects curriculum or funding of our schools, that prior to bringing forward that bill, they have to go spend a week in a public school. Because again, there is a huge disconnect between what is actually happening in our schools and what some of these legislators believe. Um, you know, and, and to that question, as far as why are they wanting to destroy our public schools? Honestly, there's a number of them. They just see it as a pot of money. I mean, it costs a lot to educate kids. Um, so some, some entities and some organizations see that pot of money and go, oh, well, you know, if we privatize, we can just skim some of that off the top. Well, that's not going to be a good system by any means for the kids in Kansas. Um, but I would tell you that a number of these organizations and a number of these individuals really don't care about the kids in Kansas. Uh, they are more concerned with growing their own profits. Um, so I guess that's kind of a quick breakdown as far as you know, who are the forces um, and what's happening out there. And something to keep in mind, we have some great organizations here in Johnson County and across the state that are working to support our public schools. Um, I probably can't mention them because I'm a part of one of them as a co-founder, but if people want to know more about that, uh, they can contact me offline. I think it's also, um, Cindy talked about KPI, but they put out these surveys and then they give it to um, legislators and they said, this is like the consensus well, it's voters in Kansas. It's not parents of students in Kansas. And, you know, people don't really get into the details. Legislators don't always read this. But like I was asking KPI and Dave Trayward, I said, you know, you're saying this, but only 40 percent of these actually have parents. And then when you actually look at those questions, uh, we have a much higher appreciation. We realize what's happening in the schools. Um, but yeah, it's people who 30, 40 years ago. I mean, I had people who are like talking about evolution uh, when they're um, sending me emails. And I'm like, this is not the issue. Um, but, you know, they really try to distort the truth and um, make it so that they're failing. Uh, we have lobbyists too. I know every year they're trying to get those vouchers um, and that's their main goal is they wanna get vouchers pushed through because they get part of that money. Well, I, I noticed that um, Leslie in the chat already did mention where uh, the source of many of those dollars for groups like KPA and AFP come from. They are. I mean, it's easy to find. They're they're financed by uh, our our friends in Wichita, um, uh, the the Cokes. And I mean, you know, there's a libertarian aspect to all of this. A lot of these people believe that fundamentally the government should not be uh, providing services for the public good. I mean, I say this as from my position as an opinion editor, not a <laughs> uh, not a legislator or anything. But um, our second question here, I'm just going to read it. Uh, I don't necessarily. Uh, and then I guess I'll give a first uh, answer at it because it's about journalists. And then if any of you have anything to add, feel free. 
Journalists can and should play a more significant role in public discourse and educating citizens, not only about the issues, but what is really at stake. How can journalists become better communicators of social and political realities? So uh, I personally disagree a bit with the premise of that question, largely for the reasons that I think Janet uh, spoke about when introducing me, which is that I, I feel like actually as a whole, uh, journalists tend to do a, a pretty good job of trying to communicate these things. There is the challenge of we live in an environment where there is so much information and so much content flowing around people at all times that it can be very difficult for someone to just focus and pay attention on what's on what's happening. You know, people do have to care about these things. And I think if someone wants to you know, go to the reflector and spend the time or subscribe to our newsletter, which you can do on our website, by the way, um, you know, and but and, you know, certainly not just us, you know, the Kansas City Star, the Capitol Journal, the Eagle, um, you know, Kansas News Service, uh, you know, KCUR, like there is there is a lot of, in my opinion, political journalism that does a fair job of that of that stuff. It is I mean, we could always use more. We can always use more, you know, support and eyeballs and, and all of that. But it it really comes down to, I mean, it's, I mean, and I'm assuming you guys get this sometimes too. Sometimes it's a tough sell on getting people engaged in state government. <laughs> I, but anyway, that's my take on that. I don't know if you have any ideas on, on, on the, I mean, I do think the consequences is important. And I think that is, if there's something that sometimes journalists don't necessarily, the, the day-to-day -day journalists don't necessarily do it saying, well, what happens two or three or four steps beyond, um, as on, on the opinion side, that's kind of what I try to do, but. I'm going to say sometimes, and this is Senate leadership, and I know this, um, because I deal with them <laughs> daily, um, a lot of times, some of those stories that make them look bad, they will give it to someone who has a paywall so that maybe other reporters don't report it because they're not the one breaking the story. And so then you have a select group who is seeing that. And um, so that's also something that they try to use so that they're not always seen in the light of day. That wouldn't wouldn't surprise me. Uh <laughs> Um, um, also here, um, so next question submitted here, how would a nonpartisan redistricting process be voted on favorably when one party has the majority voting power? So going back all the way to our first, yeah. our first question. So I introduced a bill two years ago now, and I will be reintroducing it as, as Senator or Representative Clayton will also, um, and sorry for the squeaking, my dog is now playing in the background, um, but it's having a different commission and making sure there's a breakup um, within the nonpartisan um, equal amounts of Republicans, Democrats, independents, and even having judicial selections as part of that. Um, again, it is hard. It, I mean, when we introduced it, we never got a hearing on it. So, um, but it goes back to public demanding um, and showing up and asking for transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here's uh, next one here. Uh, what are you willing to do to ensure that women have equal rights to gun rights? Can you <clears throat> see what? I'm not sure. The, can you repeat that question? And so, so the 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 question submitted was: What are you willing to do to ensure that women have equal rights to gun rights? So, I think it's. I think the suggestion is, you know, with the potential you know, votes coming up about abortion rights and the like. And I mean, that's just my. Yeah, I guess I'm not aware of any um, that the Second Amendment is being applied differently to men and women. I definitely think we need to make sure uh, as when a partner, dating partner, intimate partner uh, is is being violent and there's domestic violence, women are much more likely um, to, to be killed. So I think that uh, we need to do more to protect women and families, but I'm not aware of any 
uh, of the Second Amendment of, and gun rights being applied differently to, to men or women? If you're asking about um, that guns have more freedom than women to make decisions, I think uh, representation matters. Um, making sure that you elect strong women. Um, I actually had um, a house member from the opposite side saying, Dinah, aren't you going to support this person? She's a strong woman. And I said, well, is she really a strong woman or is she just going to do what leadership tells her to do? And so I think, again, making sure you know who is on the ballot and making sure that they're going to represent you and that they're going to think for themselves and actually read bills instead of get the little memo from leadership that tells them how to vote. You know, to that end, uh, we are in another election cycle in the House and Representative Hoy and I are both opposed in our general elections. As I was sort of going over some of the numbers last night, one little statistic kind of popped out at me and it's kind of funny. Most of the people in Johnson County who hold more moderate political beliefs, out of those who do, almost all of the ones who are facing opposition are female. So it, you know, to me, it kind of looks like, ooh, are you coming after the women? Uh, by all means, I do feel like uh, people are coming after the women, in particular with this very egregious amendment that I urge all of you to vote no on on August 2nd. And um, but also I, I really do feel like the heat is kind of being turned up. And um, and so, I, again, I think that to speaking earlier about some of the gaslighting that we heard, uh, we hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, gosh, well, you know, we do support strong feminine, strong women, we support feminism. And yet here we are with them doing the very opposite, uh, telling us that they're trying to protect us by taking away our constitutional rights. Well, um, you know, no, thank you. Uh, I need my own rights myself. I can open my own doors. And I think a lot of other women in the state feel the same way. I think above all, what uh, I'm proudest, the most proud of when it comes to my co-panelists here is the fact that all of them treat voters with respect, mutual respect, regardless of their gender identity, regardless of their gender, and regardless of any of their statuses. I think there's a lot of equality and respect going on. And again, I think that's just what our voters want. Super rambled, but I think that you all understand what I'm saying as well. And I um, appreciate that. Uh, we are, are drawing, uh, drawing close to the end here of the question and answer uh, session. I, I want to actually mention uh, one thing before I ask the final question, which is there have been a lot of uh, comments, uh, kind of, uh, we kind of circled around a bunch uh, as a topic, is the notion of transparency. Uh, people actually knowing what's going on in the legislature. So another piece that I think was, uh, you know, just to tout the reflector again, but our, uh, our editor uh, in chief Sherman wrote a, a piece about um, essentially lack of transparency this last session, how so much of biz the business of the session has been conducted in the darkness, so to speak. Um, there are some proposals in that for some reforms from the Coalition for Op Open Government. We're actually going to be publishing an op-ed from them tomorrow. So, just our little, a little, our little plug there, because I think in, in almost all of these issues, one of the issues, one of the main concerns is just knowing what legislators are actually doing or leadership is actually planning to do. So, um, so final question for all of you. Um, what should we start preparing for next year? And Senator Sykes, let's start with you. Uh, so I was actually at a um, legislative roundup with I think everyone else on this call and Senator Masterson, the Senate president was asked that same thing. And uh, he said, well, it depends on who the governor is, but uh, you can guarantee a tax on um, women's reproductive rights, um, continued attacks on education. I think um, you can probably anticipate some new constitutional amendments. I feel like this is a constitutional amendment. It's like Oprah Winfrey and you get a constitutional amendment, but um, I think we will see all of those again. And 
honestly, if we do not reelect Governor Kelly, uh, it's only going to take 21 votes to pass all this egregious thing. So, you know, stay connected. Uh, all elections are important, but uh, we have to be able to stop this bad policy. And I think it only gets worse if it only takes 21 votes. Um, Senator Holscher. <laughs> you know, here's a couple of things to think about. Um, something about the legislature. One, um, bad bills never die. So, yep, they'll come back and keep coming back and keep coming back. And secondly, it can always get worse. So to that point of uh, what happens if we don't reelect Governor Kelly, um, like I said, lots of bad things get fast tracked then. Uh, and, you know, one thing we didn't even talk about, and uh, my apologies that I lost power there for a couple minutes, but so I was off, um, off the call for a little bit. But, you know, there was a bill in the health care committee that would allow vaccine exemptions uh, for school aged children. And we're talking all vaccines. So basically, kids could go to school and not have to be vaccinated. So if you all like mumps, measles, rubella, those types of things, I mean, this is the way to usher those diseases back in that, you know, have been gone. Um, that bill passed out of committee five to three. It passed on the Senate floor and to the point that Dinah just made, okay, you know, right now with Governor Kelly vetoing things, they have to get a two thirds majority. But if she's not there, bills like that pass all day long. And that is what is hugely, hugely concerning. So those are two things to keep in mind. Bad bills never die and it can always get worse. But the flip side is we can stop these things. We can change the trajectory. And so my motto this year for everybody is we got to have you vote and. And I'm encouraging people to think of what are three things you can do? Vote and. Donate, vote and tell 10 other people, vote and join voter to voter, vote and canvas for candidates. That is something you can do that makes a big impact on helping us get good people elected. So I challenge you uh, to think of those three things because this is not a year to vote only. We got to vote and do more. Okay, Representative Hoy. Yeah, I, I agree with what's been said so far because as we look for uh, toward the future, toward next year, it is going to be very dependent on uh, how the elections play out. And we all on this call have um, power to influence the way that turns out by talking to more voters and getting that messaging out there. And uh, in 2018, when it was Governor Kelly and, and Chris Kobach, I would tell people, because we, we knocked a lot of doors, made a lot of phone calls, What's what's scarier talking to your neighbors, talking to voters, making that cold call, knocking on someone's door you don't know or or a governor Koba and Derek Schmidt. He might be a little bit uh, nicer. He's not going to roll up on you with his Jeep and his fake gun, but he's going to his veto pin. The bills he's going to put forward are the same. It's the same stuff. He's just maybe a little nicer. We need Governor Kelly there who um, is, is going to put a stopper on education savings accounts, on bad gun bills, on bad voting bills, and uh, not advance policies that aren't even coming from Kansans. The people testifying on these education bills and, and a lot of these other stuff are, are people from out of state uh, or not actual you know, parents and, and stakeholders. So uh, when, as I look to next year, I, I, I get motivated to work really hard on on getting reelected and getting good people reelected because that's what's going to influence how, how good it can get or how bad it can get. Okay. And representative Clayton, it all comes down to you. Oh, I love that. Um, Blows us so, out. Well, again, I think that a lot of the issues that are coming up in this election cycle in particular are really putting us at a precipice. For years, I was able to work across the aisle and keep that nasty constitutional amendment uh, to take, you know, to create second class citizens out of people who can have children to keep that off of the ballot. Um, but now we know that it is going to a vote of the people. Again, remember how I mentioned that um, 
we're up against folks who don't want to just roll up their sleeves and fight it out on an open, fair field. Uh, unfortunately, in this legislative system, I have found one thing is true, and that is that there are no fair fights. We are not in a fair fight here. And we need to understand that and we need to fight harder. Uh, having served on both the majority and the minority side, although as a former moderate Republican, I kind of served as a minority within the majority, you learn a lot about how to work with people and about what is important to them. And so I think having worked under three different governors, one thing that I can say is that there are opportunities to find common ground across the aisle. Cindy Holscher and I were the founders of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus that overturned the tax plan. That's why we have the surplus. It has nothing to do with people printing more money, which is what we've heard Ty Masterson, the Senate president, say at a chamber event earlier this week. But in any case, I think that, again, what people in Kansas want more than anything is calm, reasoned response and a normal functioning government. I think that keeping the drama out of everything and keeping it to common sense, oftentimes, um, you know, I've said this before, people, you know, say make America great again. I just want it to be boring again. I would like government to bore all of you and be so boring that we don't even need to have these conversations. And so that's what I am going for. It's not the most sexy thing, but that is the government that you all deserve, a government that functions easily so that you can live your lives. And it is in your hands in August, in November. And so I know that you all will talk to your friends, get them to register to vote, vote in advance, and make sure that you're voting your conscience and voting with your brain. And I think that mainstream and League of Women Voters gives everyone an excellent opportunity to get a hold of these resources so that you can make the most informed decision because this is your government. It's your money. You're paying for it. And you have an opportunity to take control. Well, thank you to all of the panelists. And I will hand it back to our hosts. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, wow, my head's kind of spinning here. Thank you to uh, Clay for doing a wonderful job moderating Senator Sykes for serving, for standing up, for going toe to toe when you need to go uh, toe to toe with anybody. S Senator Sykes, wow, we saw you in action this year. It was fabulous. Representative Clayton, uh, we've got we always get good good quotable tweets for you, good quotable comments to share. Uh, you pack a good punch. And Representative Hoy, thank you. Uh, you've just done wonderful work. So thank you all. Clay, how do we thank you? You did a fabulous job. I can't wait to read those articles you were talking about for tomorrow. And uh, the Kansas Reflector is my go-to in the morning. Laurel Birchfield, thank you. Laurel Birchfield with Mainstream and Connie Taylor with The League. So we are going to, as you can see from the slides coming ahead, we are modeling Clay's advice to act. We are modeling Senator Holster's advice to vote and. One of the ways we can do that is by getting involved in the programs that you uh, we're gonna run through here. We have lots of opportunities in June alone to reach more than, well, thousands of people through our civic engagement programs with the League of Women Voters. We have programs this Thursday about super PACs in the courts. Why do we need to know that? Because we need to be informed. We, that, that event is free and open to the public. We are doing voter registration and engagement drives on two weekends in June in partnership with the Church of the Resurrection. We will be at five campuses uh, of the Church of the Resurrection at every service. Uh, they have 20,000 members that uh, worship on the week, 20,000 members, and we're trying to reach as many as we can. So sign up, be a part of that initiative. Other opportunities are together we can save uh, Kansas with Mainstream Coalition, become a member. They uh, Mainstream got me involved in the work that I'm doing. We're so grateful for them. Uh, visit their website. And lastly, 
so Representative uh, Senator Holstein talked a lot about the voter network. So if you're a little bit shy about going door to door and you can't quite overcome that, you can use this tool to be in touch with 10 of your closest friends, 10 people that you have a trusted relationship with, whether it's at work or in your neighborhood. And this is a way for you to share the facts and encourage them to get to the polls. And we know from past years that the number of people, the turnout, voter turnout for people in the voter network far surpassed the turnout of other citizens in Kansas. And now we thank you all for being with us today. It's been a wonderful morning. We have a lot to do. We'll see you next time. Oops, and we'll see you in Wyandotte County, my mistake. Um, more Memorial Hall in partnership with Wyandotte, uh, the Voter Rights Network of Wyandotte, League of Women Voters of Johnson County and Mainstream Coalition join County Brown Collins and other activists and legislators on Saturday, June 25th. And now I'll say goodbye. <laughs>